it is said that anybody who reads little bit of Bhagavad Gita or drinks a little bit of Ganga Jala or thinks of Krishna, the Divine, for some time at least, such a person need not have a conversation with Yama or need not face Yama. Most of us, towards the end of our lives, though we have lived a full life, yet we are not satisfied. And we keep negotiating with Yama. Give us a little more time so that we can enjoy a little more. Now that I have only son, I should see my grandson. And when grandson is born, I should see my great-grandson. And when the great-grandson is born, I should see my great-great-grandson. And it goes on. That is why Bhartri Hari says in Vairagya Shatakam, Trishna na jirna vayameva jirna. Our desires, our thirst does not end. We end, but our desires don't end. And then, if the desires don't end, then we are born again. As Mundaka Upanishad says, Kama abhir jayate tatra tatra. Because of the desires that we have, we are born again and again in different places to fulfill these desires. So the essence of all spirituality is to develop a state of mind which is desireless. But then when you are desireless, how do you work in this world is the next question. You have desire for nothing. Then what should be the motivation for somebody to still be active and working in this world? So that is the question which is a very important question. Many people think we can become sannyasis because that is when we have no desires and we, can, we need not do anything in this world. But then if everybody has only that as the way to attain moksha, then who is going to run the world? Or should we say all those who run the world, the society in different positions and different professions, are they all ignorant people who are not eligible to attain moksha because they have some desire or the other? What should be the method? What should be the way? Is a question that everyone must find an answer to. But most importantly, our scriptures never discouraged us from undertaking action in this society. They never said, run away to the forests. Some school of thought, some gurus, some philosophers may recommend that as the method. Leave everything and run away. Because everything is maya, maya, maya midam, akilam hitva, brahma padam tvam, pravisha viditva. You leave everything, it's all maya. But then when we are in the body and we have duties to carry, carry out every day, responsibilities, and duties to discharge, how do we still attain Brahma Jnana? How do we still attain Paramapadam? How do we still attain Moksha? While being active in the world is the question that most of the world needs to find an answer to. A few may take through the path of total renunciation and run away to the forests. But not all can do that. So what is the way for the others? That answer is given in Bhagavad Gita, largely throughout Bhagavad Gita. But more importantly, in this Sankhya Yoga, Sankhya Yoga, the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, is like the summary, the essence of the entire Bhagavad Gita. If you see the Dhyana Shloka which says, Sarvo Panishado Gavo Dogdha Gopala Nandana Patso Vatsa Sudhir Bhokta and Dugdham Gita Amritam Mahat. It compares all the Upanishads to cows and it says Gopala Krishna is the, the milkman, the cowherd boy who is going to milk this cow and Arjuna is the one who is going to drink the milk and what is this milk? This milk is the Gita, Bhagavad Gita. So essence of all Upanishads is Bhagavad Gita. Essence of Bhagavad Gita is Sankhya Yoga, the second chapter. Therefore, I thought it is important that we spend a little time understanding it. So if Upanishads are cows, milk is Bhagavad Gita, then after churning it, the butter that comes out is this chapter, second chapter, according to me. Because it contains all the important concepts of yogas, karma yoga, jnana yoga, to an extent bhakti yoga, raja yoga. All these are summarized in a way in this very chapter. And look at the teacher that Krishna is. 
you have to really observe Krishna all through the Bhagavad Gita, the way he teaches. He creates a situation, as we all know last time we, thought, we told, he creates a war situation. What better way to teach somebody about duties than to push them into the situation and not leave it to their imagination, but actually make them experience the gravity of the situation and then make them take decisions and do their duty. Design thinking we talked about. That is Krishna. Last chapter, he took the chariot, placed it in front of the beloved gurus and grandfather of Arjuna. And then Arjuna got confused. And he started giving some convenient philosophical excuses. We should not kill anybody. Ahimsa paramo dharma kind of. We, why should we destroy our own people? Even if they have harmed us, how does it matter? How should I live after killing them? Our children will have no fathers. There will be Varna Sankara. There will be mixing of races. Our Pitrus will fall from the heavens because they won't get their daily prayers and rituals. And he goes on and on and on. Basically, all these are excuses of not fighting the war. And for once, we may all think that Arjuna is such a kind-hearted warrior. He is okay to beg all his life, but he does not want to harm even those who have harmed us. Sounds like a very idealistic thought. But Krishna does not agree to it. Because this reasons that these reasons that Arjuna gave were not born out of discrimination. They were all born out of attachment, out of ignorance. And therefore Krishna does not allow that to happen. If it was another situation, maybe Krishna would have told all right. But here Arjuna was not thinking in a discriminatory way. He was he was taken up his buddhi was not thinking in the right way. He was attached to his people, so he did not want to kill them. Because if he, if he really was such a kind-hearted person, he would not have come to the war at all on that morning. But he came prepared. However, after seeing his kith and kin, whom he loved, not Duryodhana, Dushasana, Karna and others, but Bhishmacharya, Dronacharya, Kripacharya, he felt, how can I kill these people? They have loved me, they have cared for me. So what if they are on the wrong side? But Krishna is a very disciplinarian teacher. He says, no mixing up things. You are not understanding what you are doing. But nevertheless, he allowed Arjuna to take a whole chapter to express himself. The patient listener that Krishna is. As a teacher, one should be a good listener. Not a, we most of the time listen to respond, to give answers. But not for the sake of listening. But Krishna is a great listener. Patiently hears the whole of the first chapters, whatever Krishna, Arjuna had to say. And then he comes to the second chapter. And how does he set the context? He gives you what he's going to teach you in the entire class. It's a teaching methodology. You know, you come and you set the agenda for the class. You tell, these are the things we are going to be learning in today's class. So I begin with this, and then as the class progresses, you should be able to learn these concepts. At the end of the class, the teacher will summarize and students will recollect all that which has been learnt. And now they have become knowledgeable. So he sets the agenda for the class. For the whole Bhagavad Gita, he sets the tone in the second chapter of what, was, what is to come in the other chapters. So Sankhya Yoga, by name itself, is, is a kind of a yoga. See, all Bhagavad Gita is a yoga. Yoga Shastra, Upanishad Utsu. Brahma Vidyayam, it is a Brahma Vidya, it is a Shastra of Yoga, it is also Upanishad. It's in fact, summary of all Upanishads. So in this Yoga word is basically used for the, from the root Yuj, Yuj means to join, to yoke, to connect, it means to unite. So all Bhagavad Gita is about uniting oneself with the higher divinity, uniting one's mind or merging one's mind in the higher mind as we learnt in Katopanishad. Do you remember? Yachet Vang Manasi Pragnya Tad Yachet Jnanatmani Jnanatmani Mahatini Yachet Tad Yachet Shantatmani Take all your senses, put them into your mind. Take your mind and put them into the discriminating buddhi, Jnanatmani. And take that discriminating buddhi, put it into the Mahati Atmani of the cosmic buddhi, of Samashti buddhi, which is good for all. The discrimination about what is good for me should now give way to what is good for all. 
and from there you merge it into the Shantatmani, that divine buddhi, which only thinks of what is best, what is good for all without any attachments. So this is the process of yoga. And Arjuna is being taught. See, now you are only thinking about what, is, what you like and what you don't like. But that is not the way to take decisions. You are feeling uncomfortable fighting this war, but that is your personal problem. Don't mix it with what is good for the whole society. And more importantly, what is your dharma? Which is beyond what is good and bad of society. Beyond that is your dharma as a kshatriya. Which is what the divine has given you this life for. To protect dharma, you are a kshatriya. You have to fight the war. So your mind should rise from your personal ideas to the idea of the society to what the divine wants us to do in our lives. That is yoga. So Sankhya Yoga is an alert, Sankhya is, is an analytical knowledge. It's not a knowledge which is theoretical, but analytical. Very uh, detailed and deductive, what you call deductive knowledge. You observe things around you, you make certain hypotheses, you analyze that against the facts and observations, then you come to a conclusion. This is Sankhya, this is the process of Sankhya, of analyzing and then acquiring that knowledge. So that is what our scriptures have taught us. You analyze everything around us. You see what's going on. Then you come to a conclusion. Test it against your experiences. Shastra Pramana, Tarkavada, then Swanubhava. So that is what Krishna is trying to teach Arjuna. That is why it's called Sankhya Yoga. Yoga or knowledge which is based on analysis. Which has been thought over, which has been observed, analyzed and concluded. That is the yoga that Krishna is going to teach. So you have already gone through the second chapter, Sankhya Yoga. I wanted to talk to all of you once every chapter finishes. I wanted to talk to you, teach you a little summary of what Sankhya Yoga is all about. So the beginning is, as we all know, he is still crying. And Sanjaya is saying that Arjuna is still under confusion. He cannot think what is right from wrong. And he almost concludes that uh, I cannot fight this war. I, it's not for me. He has already fallen on his seat. The Gandiva has slipped from his hand. Sweat is on his forehead and he has developed examination fever and is shivering. So we don't know what next. So that is the time when Krishna scolds him to shake him out of this reverie, this, this constant crying and lamenting. So Krishna had to use some strong words. See, he's a teacher. That is why I say I enjoy the teaching methodology of Krishna. Sometimes people keep talking and talking and they are not ready to listen. That time I have to raise my voice. Hey, then everybody is silent. Then I have their attention. So now Krishna, to get Arjuna's attention, he says, where is this weakness coming to you from? Kutastva kashmalam idam. Where did this negative thoughts, these kind of depressing thoughts coming to you from? What has happened to you? You know, so he sets the tone and Arjuna is woken up from this state of uh, kind of a hypnotic despondency. You know, he doesn't want to think anything further. He says, how did it all come to you? And he straight away scolds him and says, Anarya Jushtam, Aswargyam Makirti Karam Arjuna, this kind of feelings that you have, it is not suiting you. It's not befitting an Arya. It is an Arya. It is not the behavior of noble people. Like teachers in the class, somebody makes a mistake. This doesn't, this doesn't suit a good boy like you when a teacher says, the student gets a shock. Am I a good boy? The teacher thinks I'm a good boy. Likewise, Arjuna is suddenly, oh, Krishna thinks of me as something better than what I think of myself. He says, you're an Arya, you're a noble person, you cannot behave like this. Akirti Karam, this will bring you bad name. So you don't behave like this. And he goes on to school. He uses a very strong word, Klaibhyam Masma Gama Partha, he says. Don't be, a, don't be unmanly. To tell this to a Kshatriya is like... <laughs> You know, it's so hurtful to a Kshatriya who's supposed to be very manly, very brave and boisterous and you tell him you are behaving unmanly. And Arjuna is further, his attention is now on Krishna. What is Krishna going to say? He says, this doesn't suit you. Don't behave like an, as if you are not a man like that. So uh, now Krishna tells him, Shudram Rudeya Daurbalyam Chaktva Uttishta Parantapaha. He says, you are Parantapaha, means you will torture your enemies. That powerful you are. And you are behaving like a, you know, a silly, uh, like a pussy cat. You are crying here. You are a lion. Wake up, stand up and fight. Don't give to this, give in to this weakness. See, that's how he 
gets the attention of Arjuna, who was otherwise going on crying, not willing to listen. So sometimes you have to scold people with hard words just to get their attention. So now that Krishna has the attention of Arjuna, he wants to teach this yoga to him. And But still Arjuna goes on saying, how can I kill these people? I rather beg and eat. What kind of goodness with the blood on my hand, blood of my ancestors, my gurus on my hand, how will I enjoy this earth at all? So I find, he says, no, I don't want to fight. He says, na yotsyamiti, I do not want to fight. And then Krishna takes up from there and he says, he, he tells that I cannot fight and he tells very clear. Before Krishna starts, another very important thing that you should note is in the shloka number 7, where after getting scoldings of Krishna, Arjuna says, okay, I understand that I am wrong, but I am confused. I do not know what to do. He says, Karpanya dosho apahat swabhava. This is not my swabhava. I am not a weak-minded. I am not unmanly. But somehow today I am like this. My cowardice has, you know, stolen away, has swept away the good sense in me. I am not, not able to discriminate. He says, Pracham itvam dharma sammuda cheta. I am confused about my dharma. Sammuda. So I do not know what is right, what is wrong. So I am asking you. You tell me what is right because I am not in a position to think right. I am attached. So I cannot think right. So he says, Yachreya syan nishchitam bruhi tanme shishyasteham shadhi maam tvam prapannam. This is very important. He says, what is right for me? What is Shreya kara? We have read in Katopanishad, Shreya versus Praya. No, Shreya shcha praya shcha manushya metat. Both are there, the pleasant and the good. The pleasant is easy to follow, but it is not good in the long term. So Arjuna has understood that he has made a mistake. Krishna has scolded him and he understands that he has behaved badly. He, has, he shouldn't have behaved like this. But then he's helpless because he's attached. So he tells Krishna, you tell me what is right for me and I'll follow. First time in the whole of Mahabharata, Arjuna submits himself to, himself to Krishna as a shishya. Till now, he's Krishna's cousin. He's a friend. They have fought over several topics. They have been playing, growing together. They did, they did everything together, very close friends. First time, Arjuna says, Shishya Steham, I am your Shishya, I am your student, I am your disciple. You teach me what is right. I am beseeching you, I am surrendering to you, Prapannam. I am surrendering to you and then you teach me what is right. See, this readiness of disciple is very important for a teacher. If disciple is not ready to learn anything, how, what can a teacher teach? So both has to happen. That's why sahana vavatu, sahana unaktu, sahana sahaviryam karvavai. Both have to be ready. The teacher has to be ready to teach. The disciple has to be ready to learn. So first time Arjuna submits, I am your shishya. Consider me as your shishya and teach me. Krishna becomes happy because he says, Krishna is very, very again beautiful word has been used. Krishna says, after looking at his further crying and lamenting and whatever, he says, Prahasan niva bharata. He smilingly talks to Arjuna. Comes in sloka 10. Tamuvacha rishi kesha prahasan niva bharata. Now Krishna speaks. And how he speaks? Out of smile. Look at this fellow. Sometimes I give smile when people are going on, lamenting about something. I just smile saying that they don't know what they're talking. So I feel very... Uh, very kind of connected to this shloka. Then you have to smile. So Krishna as a teacher has become happy with Arjuna's surrender. Prasad Niva Bharata. He speaks with a smile to Arjuna, not with anger, not with disappointment. And then what does he teach? The very opening shloka is like a siksa, out of the boundary. Very first message that Krishna gives. He says, Ashochyanva shochastvam pragyavadansha bhashase gatasun agatasuncha nanu shochanti panditaha. He says, what should not be worried about, what should not be lamented about, you, should, you are lamenting about that. But the noble ones, the wise ones have told that what is not worth lamenting about, you should not cry about that. What is there and what is, what is there now and what is not there, it means those people who are alive now and those people who, who are already gone, one should not cry over them, he says to Arjuna. Because Pandita, the wise ones, don't cry over them. Now this should make Arjuna curious. We should cry over our losses. We should cry over our difficulties. We have all the right to lament over our problems. Why is Krishna saying that one should not? 
one should not and he says that the thing that you are crying about is not even worth crying about ashochananva shochastu it's not even worth crying about what are you crying about this so arjuna is naturally all ears to know what is krishna talking why should i not lament about this war why should not cry about killing my own kith and kin what is krishna talking so krishna says see there was never a time when you and i were not there or these kings and all the warriors were not there nor there will be a time when none of us will be there again arjuna is confused but if i kill them they are not going to be there and before they were born they were not here and if i die i also won't be there tomorrow what is krishna talking in puzzles don't cry about something which should not be cried about and don't there was never a time when all of us were not there not there will be a time when all of us won't be there how is it possible because bodies are born bodies grow bodies die you know the six vikaras of the body shad vikaras we say right chayate haste vardate vipriyamate apakshiyate mriyate so we all grow we die at the end born we grow and die so that happens to all then what is krishna saying that there was never a time when we were not there so that is how he creates jignasa inside arjuna creates curiosity see again a very good teacher he creates curiosity in the shishya so that he is all ears to know what is he is talking about apparently kind of a paradoxical statement but then arjuna is all ears now and then first time he reveals to arjuna the concept of dehini dehi and deha we all think we are the body arjuna also thought he is just the body or at best the mind and the senses and the emotions antakarna but beyond that we are also something actually we are only that that concept was first introduced in this shloka dehi nosmin yatha dehe kaumaram yavanam jara tatha dehantara prapti dhiras tatranam huyati like birth happens growth happens one becomes a boy then becomes a man then becomes an old man and then dies again the embodied one acquires another body and therefore the wise one the discriminating ones don't lament over these losses of the bodies because they are not the body they are the ones who have been embodied inside this body dehina is like the house owner and the house house may be constructed house may get destroyed and reconstructed again but the owner remains is what krishna is saying this is a new concept to arjuna again is a new concept to everybody in bhagavad gita so far we didn't discuss that there is something called an embodied inside this body and that is what you are that is what does not die is the first time this concept of atma is being introduced over here and he says i will not go through all the shlokas but this shloka is important and then he says nasato vidyate bhavo na abhavo vidyate sataha he says there is never a time when the illusion can exist now asat asat means that which is which does not have its independent existence the our scriptures call it asat sat is that which has an independent existence for example man is existence but husband is a dependent existence on being a man or woman is an existence and wife is a dependent existence without a woman there can't be a wife without a man there cannot be a husband so husband is asat and man is sat if you compare it, but actually if you go deeper you see atma alone is sat and body and mind are asat so that is what krishna is trying to tell that there was never a time when that that which does not exist has any permanence there we cannot be permanent that that which does not exist cannot be permanent so asat is from that point of view because the bodies are dependent on atman for its existence we think we are breathing so we are alive we are eating so we are alive but the truth is that we are alive so we are able to eat we are alive so we are able to breathe katobhishad says that na prane na pane na martyo jivati kashchana itarena tu jivanti yasmine ta upashrita it says just by your prana apana udana vyana samana you are not alive because of your pancha pranas because of something else these things happen so you are alive so this concept has been introduced saying that that which is an illusion never exists and that which exists is permanent it can never disappear so why do you worry again he goes on to elaborate over there that atma which is the shashvata nitya that always exists bodies come and go therefore don't lament over the 
passing away of bodies. That's the conclusion from here. And he says, if you think you are killing, killing them, ya enam vetti hantaram, ya chainam manyate hatam, ubhau tau na vijani tau, nayam hanti na hanyate. This one is neither killed nor it kills. Atma neither is killed nor it kills anybody. Because Atma is everything. Therefore, those who think somebody is killing somebody else and somebody is killed, both don't know what is the truth. So if that side, Kauruvas party thinks that we are going to kill Pandavas and Pandavas think we are going to kill Kauruvas, both don't know that this is not the truth. Because the truth is Atman never can be killed, nor it kills anybody. So this is a very important shloka. Na jayate mriyate va kadachin nayam bhutva bhavita vana bhuyaha ajo nitya shashvatoyam purano na hanyate hanyamane sharire. 20th shloka again. It is never born, it never dies, there was never a time once born, that it disappeared. It always was once it was born. And there will never be a time when it won't exist. Look at the beauty of this set. There's no scripture, no religion, no philosophy in the world talks this way. Only we talk in Sanatana Dharma. That we are ageless, we are birthless, we are deathless, we are ever. Nobody else says this. No religion of the world says this. It is Ajo Nitya Shashwata. It is never born, it is always there. It is Shashwata. Forever. Purano, it is the oldest. It came in the beginning when the universe started. Creation happened, it ap appeared then. So the oldest it is. Na hanyate hanyamane sharire. If the body is destroyed, it is not destroyed. This is a very important shloka. You must pay attention to this. Then he, the most famous shlokas about Atman. This is all Sankhya Yoga. So he says, Atman vasansi jirnani yatha vihaya. We all know that shloka. That we like, we give up old clothes and acquire, take new clothes. So also the Atma, gives up the old bodies and takes up new bodies. So this is the idea why you will not discuss with Yama, please give me another extension. Because you know, all right, this is an old body, it must go. I will get a new body if I need to get one. Otherwise, I will get out of this cycle of birth and death by being desireless. So this idea, this clarity is important. Nainam Chindanti Shastrani, again a very important shloka from here. So you are beyond all this. Body will go through all these things, but you will not go through. They give confidence to the dying soul. And the dying soul feels relieved. Oh, I'll continue. I'm not going to end with the end of the body. So these are the very important shlokas that children should memorize. Of course, they should memorize the whole Bhagavad Gita. Then I will skip a few and uh, look at Krishna's logic. So, so far he went saying that Atma exists which does not die. Therefore, don't worry. Even if you kill them, they don't really die. Even if they kill you, you also really don't die. So how does it matter? Let's go ahead at the war. That is what Krishna is trying to convince him. But he looks at Arjuna's face, there is a big question mark over there. What is this Atma? What is this body? So far I did not know that Atma was there, I knew body was there and things like that. So Krishna gives another logic, that is why Sankhya Yoga. He says, Atha chayanam nitya jatam nityam va manyasem rutam tatha bitvam mahabaho naivam shotishtu marhasi. But even if you think that you are being born and you are constantly dying, then also you should not cry, he says, do not worry. If you don't believe in Atma and you think we are all going to be dying, and we are going to be born again. If you believe only in birth and death also, still you should not lament. Now look at another curiosity in Arjuna. Because jatasya hi dhruvam rutyu, dhruvam jarnam rutasya cha. Because anybody who is born has to die someday. They'll die today in the war. What is the big deal? That is what Krishna is trying to explain to Arjuna. Anyway, they're going to die. You know that. Even if you don't believe in Atma, okay, keep that philosophy aside. Let us take the next analogy. Let us do some more analysis. Anyway, anybody who is born will die any, someday. So how does it matter if they die in the war or they die in the ventilator? Anywhere somebody has to die. So don't worry about that also. Let us go ahead with the war. Is what Krishna is telling. Avyakta dini bhutani, vyakta madhyani bharata, avyakta nidananyeva tatraka paridevana, he says. Before we are born, we are unmanifest. When we are born, we become manifest. When we die, we become again unmanifest. So what is the big deal about it? Why are you crying? Let us go ahead with the war. So Arjuna cannot say, see, I don't believe in Atma because I can't smell Atma, touch Atma, taste Atma, see Atma. So what can I do? I don't believe in your philosophy. So Krishna is saying, okay, don't believe in Atma. At least you believe in birth and death. You know everybody is born is going to die. So anyway, they are going to die today or tomorrow. What does, how does it matter if they die today than tomorrow? This is how he is able to convince Arjuna. Anyway, after this he talks, a very beautiful shloka comes about Atman. Ascharivat patati paschati kaschatena, ascharivat vadati tathaiva chanya. People talk about this Atman in a very, they are all stupefied. 
they talk in wonder because they don't understand its nature. Even after talking about it, Ashchari Vashchayana Chayana Anyam Shurnoti, Shutva Pienam Vedana Chayva Kasti. Despite listening to it several times from several people in several satsangs, still this doesn't get inside our head that we are Atman and we are not the body. This is the plight, this is the, this is the subtleness of this truth. So Arjuna, Krishna is so good, he is telling that, don't worry if you don't, didn't understand this, because a lot of people have not understood. I have taught this to many people, but not many have understood. So don't worry if you don't understand this, that is how he is able to tell him. But he says that it exists in all, so don't worry. He just simply goes and tells him that don't run away from the battle now, because third logic, second, first logic is, Atma exists, so don't worry, nobody dies. Two, even if you don't understand, anyway, everybody who is born is going to die, so let us go ahead with the war. Three, he says, if you run away from your duty, everybody will laugh at you. Everybody will make fun of you. Because you have run away from the battlefield like a coward. Your enemies will jeer at you. They're, they will talk about you for generations that there was one coward called Arjuna who ran away from the battlefield. <laughs> See, he's bringing down the analysis to even this level. At the most supreme level, Atma. Middle level, birth and death. Even lower than that, if you run away, people will laugh at you. At least to save your name, please fight. Because it is better to die than to have a bad name, Krishna tells. How he is teaching Arjuna? That is very interesting in this Sankhya Yoga. And he goes on to say, a lot of things he says about that, that you know, in this, that they will, they, will, uh, they will be ridiculing you. He says, it is, there is nothing worse, no pain worse than being ridiculed by people and laughed at by them, especially being a Kshatriya who ran away from the battlefield. So he explains all these things and then he says, very logically he says, see, fight any which way, because hatova praptyasi svargam jitva va bhokshase mahim. If you die on the battlefield as a Kshatriya, you will attain Swarga. We all know that our ancestors used to always think of going to Swarga after death and not to the Narka. Swarga was supposed to be a place where you enjoy the fruit of all your good actions. So you as a Kshatriya should at least try to go to Swarga after death. So even if you die on the battlefield, you will go to Swarga because you did your duty, you didn't run away. And even if you win, you will enjoy the kingdom. As a Kshatriya, you are supposed to rule the kingdom. Either way, it's good. So tasma tuttishta kaunteya yuddhaya kritanishtaya. Therefore, get up. Don't sit on that seat anymore. Get up now and decide to fight. How Krishna is convincing him. And then he says, how do you fight? This is very beautiful. He says, Sukha Dukha Samay Kritva Labha Alabhav Jaya Ajayav Tato Yuddha Yujjasva Naivam Papam Vav says, if you think you are committing sin by killing your kith and kin, don't worry. If you fight the war with the idea that both good and bad are equal to you, Sukha or Dukha, joy and sorrows are equal, and winning and losing is equal to you, with that idea you fight this war. The one who fights like this, without attachment to the results, never incurs sin. This is the answer to the question, how do we act in the world? Because when we act, we may do many things, some are sinful, some are meritorious. At the end, how are we going to be facing the consequences? Krishna says, you can, run, you can be absolved of all the consequences if you develop this idea that you don't do action for the sake of results. You do it for the sake of doing, for the sake of doing your dharma. And that is why he comes and says that here, till here, I have given you knowledge of Sankhya Yoga, analytical knowledge of why you should fight the war. Let us revise halfway through the chapter we are. First, you are Atman, you don't die. All are Atman, nobody dies. So it doesn't matter, nobody kills, nobody is killed. Believe in this truth and let us fight the war. Two, even if you don't believe Atman and all this truth, because a lot of people have not understood it, you know there is birth and death and everybody is going to be dying someday. Either ways, your grandfather, your uncles, your cousins and your gurus are going to die someday. So how does it matter if they die in the battlefield which is being fought for the sake of righteousness? Let it be, he says. Third, he says, if you run away from the battlefield being a Kshatriya, people will mock at you, people will laugh at you and a living with a bad name is worse than death. So don't do that. Go and fight the war, because if you fight the war and you die, you will go to Swarga. If you survive this war, you will rule the kingdom. Either ways, you are benefiting. So get up and fight the war. This is how first part he concludes.